This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning, please be seated. I'd like to begin this sermon this morning with a testimony about a mission cross. We normally do that on Healing Sunday, but today is the day I'd like to share a testimony with you about a mission cross. This past week, my wife Tara and I had the privilege of being in Jamaica for her post-ordination honeymoon with Jesus, you could say. I got to tag along, I was so grateful. And other than the 7.7 magnitude earthquake, which literally shook our chairs, it was a pretty smooth week. It was a spiritual retreat. That was its intention, to reflect upon all that God has done in our lives as a couple, two priests now serving God and the kingdom, and to consider all that God has next for us. It's been a busy season for our family, and this was a good time to take some needed rest. What I did not expect was what God would have for me the first morning I woke up. I heard the most beautiful singing outside. I went out on the patio, trying to see where that voice was coming from, and there in the distance I saw a gardener in a full green jumpsuit and a green hat underneath a palm tree gathering palm branches, singing his heart out. It was not an overtly Christian song, but I just knew I was sensing the Holy Spirit in his voice. Keep that image in mind of gathering palm branches. We'll come back to it. The next day, I went for an early morning swim. Now, this particular location in Jamaica is made up of lush gardens, but also volcanic rocks right along the water. As I came up out of the water and climbed up the volcanic rock throughout this carved staircase, keep in mind there were no gardens anywhere near here, as I came up the staircase, I suddenly found myself face to face with the gardener. And I looked at him and I just blurted out, you are the one with the voice from the Lord. And I don't re remember really what happened in the next 10 minutes, but he preached to me. <laughs> and despite the different accents we both had, despite our very different backgrounds, despite the fact that we are of different races. He was preaching the word to me and I understood every, every word of it. It touched my heart so deeply. And at one point I was able to get a word in edgewise and I said, spirit speaks to spirit. And he nodded and kept preaching. <laughs> and by the end of the conversation, I got his name, David. I said, I'm Joe. And I said, I'm, I'm a priest actually. And my wife over there, she's a priest too. And he just smiled and nodded. <laughs> And I said, well, I'll see you later. And kind of stunned and amazed by that spiritual experience and that deep connection of spirit speaking to spirit. And I know you know what I'm talking about. You've had these moments where you don't know a person, but you know them. And they can speak the truth of God in your heart. And as I walked away, I reflected upon a scripture that I don't think about much, but it really came to my mind. I actually had to look it up specifically to get the right words. So I'm going to read it to you. It's 1 Corinthians 2.13. This is what we speak. Not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. That's exactly what happened. A couple days later, toward the end of our week, there's a knock on our patio door. And I open it, and it's David the gardener. Now, granted, I was thrilled to see him, but I also knew that what he was doing was probably not really acceptable in terms of the rules of the property. For a groundskeeper to ask to come into a guest's room would probably get him in some trouble. I don't know. But I was thrilled to see him. And I said, come on in. And he came to me for counsel. And my wife, Tara, who's a priest now, as you know, suddenly appeared, seeing us talking with holy oil in one hand, and yes, a mission cross in the other. And we made a circle and we anointed David and we prayed with him and she gave him a mission cross and you all were there in that moment because that mission cross represents all of you through the Spirit. 
He said, in all my years here, I've never had this experience with guests. And I'm having some trouble with my manager, if you could pray about that. So thinking he was relatively new, I said, well, how long have you been here? And he said, over 15 years. So I knew this was a wholly special moment, not just for him, but for us. And for me to be able to take this testimony back to you, because what we're talking about is the Holy Spirit. And our reading from Luke, you just heard is all about the Holy Spirit. We'll get to that in a moment. But I'd like to come back to that image of David collecting the palm branches, which was the first image I saw of him. And keep in mind that in the Bible, it begins and ends in a garden. This was not lost on me. And as I checked out, they gave us a form. And I've never seen this before in a hotel. But it said, if there are any staff members you'd like to highlight and make mention of, please fill it in here. So of course I said, David the groundskeeper. And I put next to it, Revelation 7, 9 to 10. Now it's possible the person reading this will know that scripture, but maybe they'll look it up. But if they look it up and they don't know it, this is what they will read. Next to David the gardener, Revelation 7, 9 to 10. There before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they cried out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And I kept thinking about David. He could not help himself from singing. And I pray that his voice will continue to go forth and touch many hearts. And may we all keep David, the worshiper, a man after God's own heart, in Jamaica in our prayers. Spirit speaks to spirit. As Paul said again in the Corinthians letter, his first to them in chapter 2, verse 13, this is what we speak. Not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. And this takes us right into our focus for today from Luke's gospel. Today is a busy day liturgically. Behind me it says Candlemas. This is the recognition that Simeon saw in Jesus the light of the world, a candle in the darkness, if you will. It's also known as the Feast of the Presentation or the Purification, and I think it's Groundhog Day, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Despite all these different perspectives on this amazing day, our focus this morning is on seeing the Holy Spirit create the people of God. And that's what we're all about as the church, the new creation, which begins even now. Even as Revelation points us to the end of time, where we will all be before the throne of the Lamb, all believers, with those palm branches in our hands and those white robes, which is why we wear white robes up around the altar. It all points to the future, and yet it's a reality now. The already, the not yet, as we say. So what's happening when Mary and Joseph present the child Jesus in the temple? Historically, this had been done before in a different context. For example, Hannah with her child Samuel, the child that she'd waited for for so long, her firstborn, her son. She brings him to the tabernacle in a place called Shiloh and presents him to Eli the priest along with sacrificial offerings. But that custom goes much further back than that. In the exodus from Egypt, the firstborn sons of the Israelites were spared. They lived. And so it became customary under the law to present one's firstborn son to the temple, to God. And I'm told that in certain portions of Jewish culture, the firstborn son is set apart for the priest in one way or another. It's a special role, recognizing that God's grace showed favor upon the firstborn. And it's a reminder each time a child was presented in the temple that they had been delivered by their deliverer, the Lord God Almighty. So Mary and Joseph are there on the 40th day of Jesus' life. They've already circumcised him on the eighth day according to the law. They're back at the temple. They're doing what you're supposed to do under the law because it's a sign that Jesus came to redeem us under the law, to take our very flesh, our human nature, and to bring his full divinity into it. Just like his baptism was for us 
to cleanse us from our sins as he stands in our place. So he fulfills the law in every way. And while a wealthy family might present a nice spotless lamb, they only can present what they can afford. The pigeons, the turtle doves. It's what they could offer. So Jesus stands for every person, if you will, coming before the Lord. Quite ordinary, yet we know so extraordinary in the spirit as the Son of God. But not everybody knows this. He's just an infant at this time. But then suddenly in the crowd, a man comes forward named Simeon. And we're told by Luke that he's led by the Spirit, that it's only by the Holy Spirit that he can recognize that this is the Messiah. Spirit speaking to Spirit. Now keep in mind that in this era, just like the Old Testament era, the Holy Spirit only came down on certain individuals at certain times for very special purposes. It was not that common. Pentecost had not yet come, where the Spirit was poured out upon the church. So Luke is telling us this is a very special moment. And if we would paraphrase what Simeon says, he basically says, okay, God, now I can die. He's been waiting for this moment his whole life. God had revealed to him through the Spirit that before he died, he would see God's Messiah. And then Anna, through the same Spirit, affirms the presence of the Christ in their midst. And what does Simeon do? And this is a symbol for all of us. He lifts the child up. He lifts Christ up. And so how does this speak to us today as the church? Last week we looked at what it means to be the church and that we are bound to Christ and we bond to God and one another. <coughs> Just like I did with David through the Spirit. Just like you do all the time with each other and those outside of these church walls where your spirit speaks to their spirit as the Holy Spirit draws you together. As the church, we're called to, like Simeon, lift the Christ up by lifting up one another. Because Christ dwells in our hearts by faith through the same spirit, and Christ in us is the hope of glory. So each time you lift another up, you're fulfilling that call that Simeon claimed, that we all claim, that lifting up the Savior in word and deed is the heart of what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be the church. Simeon and Anna, these two aged saints, are Israel in miniature and Israel at its best. And this is like you today in this church, devout, obedient, constant in prayer, led by the Holy Spirit, at home in God's temple, longing and hoping for the fulfillment of God's promises. Yes, this is God's temple, but actually you're the temple. You're the new temple. In you, God's Holy Spirit dwells. In you, Christ is lifted up. And as Simeon prophesied, it would not be an easy path for Mary and Joseph that this child would be the sign spoken against for the rising and falling of many. What this means is that the rich and the powerful and those that could not see God's Messiah in Christ opposed him and all those who followed him. And it remains so today. That's why Hebrews talks about we will go through a testing. But Christ is with us. And he's been tested in every way and is strong to stand with us through his spirit. So as Christ is raised up in you, and you seek to raise Christ up in another, be prepared for the testing. Be prepared to be opposed. But know that Christ is with you always. Now and even unto the end of the age. And ultimately, if God be for us, who can be against us? As we have the Holy Spirit, we find, as we live this life together as the church, that the Holy Spirit begins to have us and takes us places we might never imagine to be about the work of mission, to always lift up Christ in one another, to recognize the Christ in one another, and to receive Christ in so many ways. The early Christians felt that they had arrived at a wise decision, according to the book of Acts, when they could say, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. 
And as the church, we seek to make decisions together that way as well. It seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us because we are people in the age of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been poured out and is creating the church all the time, not simply with structures or denominational lines or affiliations, but with hearts that have been renewed through the Spirit, where God promises to put in us a new heart and a new spirit and to connect us with each other in such amazing ways as the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with sighs really too deep for words. May we be that church that is anointed by the Holy Spirit, that seeks to raise up Christ in every way as our chief concern and our chief mission. Because Jesus, the light of the world, promises to shine in our hearts now and always. This is the new creation. You are part of God's new creation. And each time we recognize the Christ in one another, each time we lift one another up, each time we connect in the spirit, we are part of this new creation underway now. This is to be the church. This is to bond as only the spirit can bring us together. This is to truly live. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.